Good morning. Today we're joined by Mark England. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nick. <laughs> I want to start off hot, as we were just saying before we started recording, it. and tell me what the meaning of abracadabra is. Glad you asked. It comes up a lot in this conversation. Once upon a time, I was living down in Vilcabamba, Ecuador, which is a small town, uh, middle of the Andes Mountains, about 45 minutes north of uh, miles north of, of the Peruvian border. So it was a pre pretty remote. And it was a hippie place, a lot of permaculture and such. And uh, went out to dinner with some friends. And one of the guys at the table knew the line of work I was in. And he goes, hey, Mark, you, you know what abracadabra means? And I'm like, yeah, 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 magic. And he goes, no, 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 no. Abracadabra is Aramaic. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, it's Aramaic. Uh, uh, and it translates to with my word I, I create or with my word I influence. I'm like, what? And he, and I, so I put my fork down and I went over and sat next to him. I'm like, dude, tell me everything. He's like, yeah, Aramaic is this, it's an ancient language. It's the language the original Old Testament was written in. And, and the, the, the teachers of the day um, that were into this, guy, they, they, they would triangulate, wear it around their neck to remind them of the power and the mechanics, the mechanism of, of words, of language, of story, of identity. And they knew that if they, um, if they got their language working for them, they were a lot more effective and potent. And uh, uh, they just, they just, they, 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 they were more powerful people as opposed to if their language was working against them, which most people's language is working against them right here, right now, today. Things are harder than they have to be, man. Yeah, just get to, um, get ourselves in the way a little too often. That's some good foreshadowing for the topic of today's conversation. But before we go on to that, let's begin with something akin to a warm up. And that's what are the non negotiables or unusual things you've done for your health and performance so far today? So I saw a Tibetan doctor once. He took one look at me, took my pulses, and he said, your primary dosha is fire. He goes, you need to wake up slow. Mm -hmm. I definitely did not take that advice. <laughs> yeah. Especially when um, uh, my friend sent me a meme and it was Joe Queen Phoenix from, from The Joker. It's a great movie, by the way. He's, got, he's, he's, he's out of character or uh, no, no makeup and he's just smiling and and it's this goofy, like really goofy looking smile. And it says, uh, uh, when, when people online complain, the small business owners, how they react when people complain about working 55 hour weeks. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. So anyway, when I, when I started to wise up to that piece of very valuable advice, um, I, I do wake up slow. I either, I either get out the door and go on a walk, stay away from caffeine and definitely screens. Um, or, or when I'm in more in the mood, uh, cause I had a, 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 an active weekend this weekend, um, wake up and do a yin yoga class. Mm -hmm. Like I'm barely there mentally. Yeah. It's just, I'm basically asleep in, in stretching pose yeah. postures and I really like it. Um, so that's, that's very good advice that I was give, given and it's right for me. I love that. I'm in the traditional Chinese medicine. I'm the fire type. And in Ayurveda, I'm the fire type also called Pitta. And I can relate. I need to do yin yoga. I, I really should be doing that. I will occasionally do those types of poses and stretches on my own. But I can, I can relate. I try and start my day with a nice long meditation or walk with no podcast, nothing in my ears, not reading or anything, just to start slow. But it's not easy. First, let's talk about like the, the higher 10,000 foot overview of how your words influence your reality. Yeah, for sure. So our language, and when I say language, I'm referring to our internal and external dialogue, what we think, what we say, what we write. So you're going to hear me talk about language a lot in this conversation. That's what I'm referring to for repetition's sake, internal dialogue, 
external dialogue. What we think, what we say, and what we write. Most people's language is forcing them to script and maintain levels of the victim mentality, and they are suffering for it. Um, their, their imagination is suffering. The, the pictures and the mental movies they're making, they're creating victim, villain, mental imagery because two plus two equals four. They're creating dense, heavy emotions, and they're trapping their breath in their chest because the victim mentality is inherently stressful. Also, mm. sympathetic nervous system response. Hello, hello, breath trapped in your chest. Hello, amygdala hijack. Shall I continue? One thing there that I came across for the first time a couple of years ago that I, was really profound to me was that we question all the information we receive externally, but how often do we question our own internal dialogue, our thoughts, our beliefs? Very rarely. Very rarely. I mean, there's a number of things going on there. It's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that my big, my problems, which in my opinion are big and huge and overwhelming. The solution is equally as big and huge and overwhelming. No, most of the time, 95% of the time, it's actually the exact opposite. And it's the easiest thing, Nick, in the world to overlook because it's right between our ears, thoughts, right under our nose, what we say, and right at our fingertips. And it's, it's to say it's consistent is a joke. Okay. I mean, what's more seductive than our own voice in our own head? Consistent. It's not, it's, it's relentless. It's the first thing when I got up this morning, did I get up, go take a leak, drink some water, start my yin yoga class, and then start thinking, start hearing a story in my head? No, that's how people realize they're awake. The story starts. And it's the very last thing that people recognize before they go to bed is the story. And then all of a sudden it's over. And then all of a sudden I wake up and there it is again. And it's kind of consistent throughout the day. It's relentless, dude. Yeah. It's relentless and most people are defenseless to it. Mm. So what are the defenses that you can enact? First things first, know there's a game to be played. The current definition of identity is from Webster's definition. The fact of being who or what a person is. Okay. That's pretty easy to dispel, which means to cast out spells, dispels. Do you see yourself differently, Nick, in any way now than when you were five? No doubt. Great. Me too. It'd be weird if you said, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, it's the same story. Uh, so what does that mean? That our identities are not facts. The fact of being who or what Nick is. No, our identities are ongoing, fluid, flexible mm -hmm. processes. And we're, it's a story and we're participating in that story. We're telling the story and we're believing the story all at the same time. And most people's language tricks them into being innocent bystanders in their life, which mm -hmm. is sad. It's sad and it's also very scary, turns out. Um, uh, it, it, people's language, it tricks them into, into, into being spectators in the stands. And life is a lot more fun and enjoyable when we're, we're in the arena. Write this down, everybody, if you got a pen and piece of paper. No risk, no magic. Has there ever been a more true statement? Yeah. And, and yeah, we, um, we're, we've made a career out of helping people use their language to stay focused on what's important, keep the drama low, build up their emotional a gas tank, um, psychological immune system, take some losses, you know, get some wins, learn some things, take, make, make some moves, you know? Would you say that your language creates your story and then your story creates your reality? <laughs> Somebody's done core language upgrade. Yes. Or if that's not the case, then it's close. Okay. So letters make up words. Words make up sentences. Sentences make up paragraphs. Paragraphs make up pages. Pages make up chapters. Chapters make up books. Okay. And it's the same thing with our, with, with our stories. We can take out reality and put in identity. You know, we can take out, also take out identity and put in mindset. We've done a, a good job of a couple of things. One of them is demystifying the conversation about mindset and identity, and then also gamifying it. Okay, we've got more language games to play than we can count. Important side note, turns out when people are having fun doing stuff, they tend to keep doing it. So when it comes to exploring their language and, and making some edits here and there, 
with a little bit of understanding of what words to use less of and why and what words to use more of and why, now you've got you've got practical mindset as in it's a practice. I can practice thinking, reading and and speaking and, and writing in certain ways or writing, not necessarily reading once you've gotten on paper. But to circle back to your question, it's what I can say definitively is that our language influences four major aspects of ourselves, which we combine those things together and most people would call them their reality, mm-hmm. which is our imagination. I've already said these things. I'm saying it again. Our imagination, our feelings and emotions, our breathing, and our posture to keep it mm-hmm. super okay. simple. So you put those four things together all at once, and that's a lot of what you're sensing. That's a lot of what you're experiencing a lot of what people would call their reality. And our language does influence those things. Yeah. Well, Mark, I want to double click into that and explore some of the things that I learned from your course, such as the three language components that people can begin noticing and working on. I'm backing into this, that the answer to this question. So I'm about to discuss everybody 85% of the language patterns that script people's problematic stories, okay? In the vocabulary in lifted conversation, it's called conflict language. Prior, and it used to be called victim mentality language, which accurate, it's accurate to the definition of the victim mentality, yet, like I said, too strong of a place to start the conversation. If you got a pen, write this down because once once pen hits paper about something, you get some extra magic, and then you're also in a very exclusive club of people that have even heard of the victim mentality, much less have written it out. The victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. That second sentence, ladies and gentlemen, right between the eyes, right where it belongs. The victim mentality depends, as in it has to have a habitual thought process. Habitual accurately implies duration and addiction. Okay. Doesn't happen overnight. And man, once that thing gets entrenched, it can take an act of Congress or a DMT pen to, to unravel that thing or just a regular pen. Um, there, if there are habitual thoughts, also known as language patterns, also known as keywords that the victim mentality has to have, well, what are those keywords? What are those? What are the key words? How do they influence my 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 mindset, my imagination, my feels, my breath? And what are the alternatives? The first of the three pillars. There's three of conflict language, which, like I said previously, what used to be called victim mentality language. It's negations. Now, my grandmother was a third degree black belt, Olympic competitor in worrying. She was as good as it gets, man. Worrying, worrying, worrying. Also known as staring at the worst case scenario and then keep staring at it and then tell people what you're, oh, I'm so worried about you. And I'm, and then it would, she would also invert it and make it this thing that we like, we needed to be grateful that she's making pictures of us going down in flames. And like, I'm like it took me a while to figure out what was going on. And once I did, I'm like, oh, negations here, they force you to stare. There's only a handful of these keywords. They force you to stare at the worst case scenario, whether you want to or not, because two plus two equals four. Okay. These, this has this, none of this conversation has anything to do with intelligence or deservance. It's all about education. So write these keywords down folks. And then I'm going to give you some examples, tell you a story. Can't. Won't. Isn't. Hasn't. 
haven't, couldn't, not, doesn't, and that's about it. First thing my driving teacher said when I got in the car is look where you want to go because you're probably going to go there. So I, Nick, I don't want to have problems with you. What did I just make a picture of? Problems with me. Problems with you. And yeah, you just heard me. What did you just make a picture of? Us having problems. Us having problems. But Nick, that's what I don't want. (laughs) You, 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 you can't go play video games if you don't finish your dinner. Parents, parents say this a lot. I hate repeating myself. Half the reason that parents hate repeating themselves is because they're repeating themselves in negation. Making them, forcing themselves first and foremost to make pictures of what they don't want to have happen once again. And then enlisting everybody else that just heard them. As opposed to, because guess what, parents, guess what? newsflash. You're going to repeat yourself. (laughs) You're going to repeat yourself a lot. Know that going in and know how to do it well. And that right there will alleviate 80% of your stress when it comes to the inevitability of repeating yourself while you're training and in training your little people. Finish your dinner and, uh, and then you can go play video games. Okay. So I just made a picture of what I want. They're more on board. Okay. Maybe it catches the 19th time. Or I'm not going to spend all my money this weekend, Nick. Okay, what did I just make a picture of? Spending your money. Here's a story, true story, that is a fantastic example of how our language, specifically in this case, a negation, one sentence, one negation sentence, took over someone. They were under, look at the words, folks. They were under this spell for a while. It was a negation. We broke it with a pen and a piece of paper and some really cool shit happened because of that. So 2014, I'm in Calgary doing a training for a sales team. I stayed after and did one-on-one sessions. I'm in a room with a young man, 23, 24. Um, She's struggling at work. Two chairs facing each other about six feet apart. So this is what he says, and this is what he does, okay? Mark, I can't keep focusing on my past. Nick, what did I just do? You negated yourself. And then what did I do with my body? You looked away and disengaged. Oh, big time. Look at the words. I can't keep focusing on my past. He t- it wasn't like a little nose scratch. He turned all the way around, looked behind him, turned and looked back at me like nothing happened because he was unaware of it. Most people are profoundly unaware of what their language is doing to them, mm. partly, partly because of how fast they use it. That's another part of the conversation we'll get to later. I said, uh, you know, you just turn around and look behind you, right? He goes, what? I said, yeah. So that's one, posture. Okay, how how does your language influence your body? Talk yourself into a good mood, stay there. Guess what? It influences your posture, okay? Talk yourself into a bad mood and stay there, and it influences your posture. This did it in in a split second. And I asked him, did you see anything when you turned around and looked behind you? He had to stop and think about it. There's that again. He said, yeah, I saw myself all alone and on the couch. And then I asked him, what are you feeling? And he was frustrated, angry, and then sad. Okay. In that order. And I could look at him and tell, I asked anyway, how's your breathing? Oh God, it's it's up here in my chest. So in one one sentence, got all four at the same time, because they all do his imagination Okay, well, his, his, his body, he turned around, looked behind him, unbeknownst to him. His imagination made the picture of him all alone and on the couch, created the negative feels of uh, anxiety, fear, and sadness, and then trapped his breath in his chest. Okay, you know what we did? Total rocket science. Where's my pen? I handed him a pen and a piece of paper, and I said, write that sentence down. He goes, which one? I can't keep focusing on my past. So he did. The fastest way to break a spell, folks, is to write it down. Mm. Okay, The definition of a spell is a word or a combination of words of great influence. That's it. And they work. There's there's only three kinds. There's the neutral stuff, but relatively neutral. Okay. Then there's the constrictive spells. Spells that 
hijack the mental imagery. Okay. So make scary pictures and movies. Let's keep this super simple. Like I'm, like I'm explaining it to a five-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Create dense energy, create tightness and rigidity in the body and trap the breath in the chest. Those are constrictive spells. And then there are expansive spells. Pictures that you make good pictures, ones you enjoy looking at. Light, levity, light, expansive energy. Loosen the body, unlock the breath, and ha- and let it descend down into its ab- in, into your abdomen where it's supposed to be a majority of the time. Three kinds of spells. So we wrote down that spell in order to break it. I can't keep focusing on my past. And I said, if that's what you can't keep doing. What can you start doing? And he had half, his answer was half of a sentence and it went up at the end. It's called up talk. You can, that's how you turn something into a question. Focus on my future more. And I said, yes, now make it a statement. And it was clunky because it was such a departure from relentless habitual story that he'd been telling himself. (sighs) The breath unlocks. I can focus on my future more. And he starts nodding, talking to himself. I can, I can focus on my future more. And now that we're focused, we're, we're looking where he wants to go. I said, well, what, um, what can you do? And he identified three things. Guess what else he did? He wrote them down. He wrote it down. And those three things were to, uh, he, there was a couple of books he had to read. They had a mentorship program that he, he could sign up for. And then all the, all the boys went out once a month, went out drinking and, and socializing and stuff like that. And, and um, he wrote me nine months later. He said, dude, I did all those things. Mm. And I moved out of my, house, my mom's house and I got my own place. Wow. Yeah. Thanks again. Affirmation. So use more of these words, folks. Can, will, do, is, has, have. It's going to help you focus on the things that are important to you. Okay. Now that's, that's one of them. That's negations. How do you recommend people start implementing this? So they notice that they use a don't, haven't, couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, all these things, all these negations. So then they go and pull out a paper and pencil or pen and write them down and then look at the sentence, notice where the negation is, and then try to formulate that into an affirmation. Soft talk. That's the gateway drug to the rest of your language. Because I know what happens when people try and do too much too fast. Mm. Okay. And I also know what happens when someone catches a piece of soft talk in a text and they take it out and they're like, oh, I feel that. They're like, oh, that dude was, he was serious. So we're painting a big picture and I'm going to give you one thing to do. So you'll have an experience with this stuff. Okay. okay. Which is where we started soft goals. Yeah. Um, is, is that okay? What talking about negations does, it gives you some context. There's a little storytelling. It, it, it puts part of the, the piece of the puzzle in place that there's a big game to play here, folks. And we're going to start with the easiest place to start. Okay, which is soft talk. I'm going to get to that in a second. The hardest place to start is projections Mm. because that's that's the second of the three pillars of conflict language. That's the hardest place to start. That's where we recommend our coaches working with people last or wait until they have unlocked their breath to start translating these things into reflections because projections, that's where the bitterness is. That's where the bitterness is. That's where the resentment is. That's where the more hard, quote unquote, hard, stuck, venomous emotions and feelings. That's where that. That's where the monster, victim, villain, mental imagery is um, is is coming into play. The first time I, I've fallen in love twice on site. The second time was uh, when I saw this work done for the first time in two thousand three at an emotional detoxification workshop on an island in the Gulf of Thailand at a cleansing resort of all places. Wow. You pay, yep, seven-day cleansing programs. You basically pay to not eat. Yeah, you get some little herbal detox pills and stuff, and you get some coconuts in a, in a, in a yoga class once a day. And people were lining up out the door to do this because it helped. And I went and watched this guy by the name of Barry Musgrave. He turned into my, my first mentor with this work. 
talked about words and stories and identities and breath. And then he asked, has anybody um, hung up on a story? Got a story cooking? And this woman just shot up her hand real fast. And she starts talking and everybody starts listening because she's, she's sharing some dirty laundry. Oh, tell me more. And it was legit, dude. Legit bad breakup story is a stinger. So the gist is that, and this happened four years prior and she was still so upset about it. She hadn't gotten in another relationship. Her and her friends went to the beach, got a house. Her boyfriend and his friends went to the same beach, got the house next door to it. Okay. This is in college. Add alcohol, press play. What are you getting? Drama. So um, one night he hooks up with her best friend in front of everybody. And then the next night dumps her in front of everybody. I know, right? Ouch. Oh, Ouch. And then out yeah. again. Yeah. And uh, her, so he had her tell the story three times. First time through, she is angry, crying. Second time through, he starts to change some of the words and you see her shoulders start to drop a little bit. Mm. And she's um, now she's sad, no tears. She's hurt, she's hurt, no tears. Third time through, he stopped her at the Lord of the Rings sentence, which was, it was a projection. They're back on that. We've been on that the whole time. Yes. He did that to me. Get her say it again. He did that to me. He, 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 then he said it himself. So it's three times. Everybody's staring at the same sentence. Remember when I said most people use their language so quickly? Part of the art and science of getting down to what's doing what, and the pen is the, the best place to do it. This is the best place to start with this. It's a tool, folks, is to slow down the storytelling process so you can get a bead on what's doing what. And then he had her, he had, he had to take that sentence. He did that to me, which was forcing the victim villain mental imagery. He did that to me. Okay. There's a, he's in the picture. I'm in the picture. I'm on the receiving end. He has to stop before I can feel better about myself, even though it's been four years and I'm still pissed. Yeah. Don't hold your breath, even though you're holding your breath. Get it. And then he, at that, the end word, me he had her take that out and put in himself talk about a radical departure yeah he he did that to himself that all it also went up at the end mm -hmm. and then you see her talk herself and the story catches and it, she goes in a completely different direction and she starts looking around he did she's not he's she's not even there anymore she's in her imagination cleaning house he yeah. did do that to himself and then she starts talking about the friends he lost and how like like it, it was worse for him actually than her and in this work a lot of people say you know well i've never thought about it like that before and our answer to that is well you've never been able to think about it like that before mm. Because when you've got one sentence that you believe to be absolutely factually true and you're highly emotionalized over it, you're in something called amygdala hijack, which is technical. Yes, I understand. And you, when someone goes into a stress response, let's take out amygdala hijack. When someone goes into a stress response, same thing, by the way, they get tunnel vision. So that sentence, he did that to me, it gets her tunnel vision, forcing her to stare at this one thing in this one way. Her, her breath is trapped in her chest, which means her listening ability goes way down, mm -hmm. which her, means her ability to change the story goes way down. She, anyone, this always, ha this is just part of the mechanics of storytelling. You lose access to your internal and external peripheral vision. So internal imagination, creative faculties, and external, uh, you literally you lose peripheral vision. And, um, and, and so he, he did, he did do that to himself. And then, so she kept going and she said, well, you know, that wasn't going to work out anyway. I was actually pretty weird. Mm -hmm. And I saw liberation. I saw liberation. I said, that's not my story, but that's my story. Cause I thought I was a tough guy in high school, in college. I wrestled in high school, got into jujitsu and Thai, uh, Thai boxing in college, competed in MMA, 
won a couple of state kickboxing titles and moved over to Thailand to go train and go pro in 2002. I was supposed to be over there for a year, six months in my knee falls off again and I have my second knee surgery. And can you, can you hear the little violins playing <laughs> and, um, and darkness descended and, and I used that experience as the final piece of damning evidence that I really, there really was something wrong with me mm. and that I really was a loser and um, I was doomed to fail. Why'd you even try dummy? And, and I entrenched this massive victim mentality so much. I didn't laugh for an entire year. And I finally got sick of myself. I said, I'll take anything but this. And I start going down and doing these weird cleanses, which led to the best stuff that I've ever been a part of in my life. And one of the, the language game is it by a, an order of magnitude. As far as um, my personal and professional life, I've benefited so greatly from it, which I can expand upon later. And so what are the key words for projections? Remember, folks, this is this is where the tough work is. OK, because this is this is where we're, we're most strongly emotionalized. Um, so know that it's there. Put it over on the side burner. OK. He, she, they, you, you need to respect me. Look at the picture that's going to make. Let's just look at the picture. The words equal what picture? You're in the picture. You're disrespecting me. Okay, it's a precept. It, I, I'm, because you need to, which means you're not. And um, which also means I'm not. Because if I really did, then I wouldn't give a shit what you do. Okay, but I need you to respect me because I can't respect me. So hurry up and respect me now. Okay. See how this works? I just woman come in and say, my husband made me think we needed to get married. Look at the words. Okay. Outside looking in, it's comical. Not for her. She was convinced. She'd been divorced for like five years. Take out the light. And I had to write that down too. Remember, fastest way to break a spell, folks, write it down. And she was smart. She caught on quick. And I said, uh, take out the he and put in I. And she just goes cocked her head to the side. And I said, who thinks your thoughts? <sighs> Me. Who, who, who creates your feelings? You or your husband? She's loosening up. Me. Just for shits and giggles. Try it out. <sighs> I made me think we needed to get married. Yes. Yes, I did. I did. And then she started talking about how she was in her early thirties. She's got this kid baby thing going on in her head and her, her parents thought this guy was the one. So they were putting the pressure on and it just, all this, it lended her. And then the, the drama that ensued afterwards, she absolved herself of any responsibility, which also in that process, I understand the seductiveness of that. Sometimes it can take the pain away in the short term and in the long term, what the, what it, what it will inevitably boil down to is you're powerless. You're powerless. Yeah. That's, and that's not fun. That's way worse than my father talks to me like a child. Look at the words. My father talks to me like a child. I mean, who talks to you more like a child than you? Okay. Who talks more, sh who's talked more shit to me about me than me. It's not even in the real, like it's not even a close second, yeah. but yet I will torch flame throw, drop nukes on people in my imagination for saying something once to me that I've said a thousand times secretly. It's crazy town. It's crazy town. And it's also uh, quite uncomfortable because, um, you know, you're breath trapped in your chest. You're not going to be comfortable in your own skin. Hard to enjoy you, you, you being you. Really hard to laugh like that, too, turns out. So we got two of them out of the way. Here's the one, folks. Soft talk. This is where you start. This is where you can start practicing because it is a practice. It's a path. Paying just a little bit more attention to your words here and there. And once in a while, whether it's in a text or an email, because that is where it'll show up first, or potentially a conversation, you pluck out a piece of soft talk and watch what happens. Like I said earlier, you're going to feel it. So can we play soft goals? Let's do it. Let's play soft goals. Um, 
give me give me a, a one personal goal for 2022 in one full sentence, please, Nick Urban. In 2022, I will get better at being on camera. Perfect. Take the word maybe and stick it anywhere in that sentence. In 2022, I might get better on camera. He went with might, same thing. Uh, what happened when you put that one word in there? It drastically reduced the chances of completing it because I no longer feel obligated. Just one word, five little squiggles, also known as letters, one, one noise, might. Okay, wow. First things first, okay. Raise the awareness about some of these words, okay? That's where it all starts. And then make it, make it easy to, to, to make some adjustments. That's it. Like I, like I said, that's it. Bruce Lee said it. I know Bruce Lee gets quoted a lot, and he nailed this one. You can show someone nothing by trying to show them everything. Okay. And if someone comes out with one thing, that's way better than 29 things that are going to have a hard time implementing. So when, when it comes time to talk about soft talk, that's 99% of the time, that's how we start this part of it with soft goals, because it does a great job of deflating the energy about things that are important to you, also known as turning yourself into a joke in your own mind and in your feels. Soft talk has got a ninth degree black belt in that. And it is majorly, it's responsible for a tremendous, a large part of people's anxiety and indecision. Okay. Nobody likes prolonged bouts of indecision. My favorite quote about indecision is from Mal Modius. He says, I prefer the fear of making the wrong decision mm. to the terror of indecision. Wow. So get up, get a, this is, so we start with soft goals and then we do the soft talk challenge, which entails, if you can get a pen and a clean sheet of paper, or if you're driving or something, you're out on a walk or a workout, go home and do this. Re rewind, go back to where, where this is. And do this exercise, because if you do, here's my promise, you're going to start clocking more of these soft talk keywords in your language and other people's language and in your emails, and that's where it starts. And here's also the second part of the promise is that if you cut out half, only half, of your soft talk keywords, and those keywords are in your language, I promise you, and you can do it in roughly about three months, give or take, you will double your confidence. That is significant. So I'm going to rattle off the soft talk keywords. I want you to write them on a clean sheet of paper five times larger than you normally write. Because what's going to happen is you're going to write, part of you is going to go, why am I writing these words five times larger? And another part of you is going to go, don't worry about it. Just pay attention to them. Keep things super simple. Okay. So right. And then you take this piece of paper, you tape it up somewhere. You're going to see it next to your computer or the bathroom mirror for seven days. That's it. Okay. First keyword, like, feel, guess, might, I might be drinking too much coffee, sort of, kind of, I say think, think. I think I should spend more time with my wife. Could. Possibly. Hopefully. And try. Cut those in half, folks. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to like it a lot. You're going to sound different, too. You're going to sound different, too. And if you play this game long enough, folks, as in making some seemingly minor adjustments to your everyday ordinary language, if you play this game long enough, you're going to become more skilled with your words. You're going to become more elegant with your speech. You're going to become, become more potent with your language, and you'll use it less 
you'll use your words less externally, you know, it's, it's, uh, and you'll get more done. And you'll be way more entertaining, way more entertaining. Okay. It, it's, I, I, there, there's only a few ways that people can be boring communicators. Uh, and, and one of them is just to use way too many words. Okay. It's way too many words. It's called transcripting. What's the moral of this story, folks? Be someone someone wants to listen to. And the punchline is be someone that you want to listen to. Ah, uh, yes. Mark, as I mentioned to you, I, after learning this, I started noticing my own communication habits over text and emails all the time. I would write one out, about to send it, but before I hit the send button, I'd go back and take out, I think, I feel, and... I wondered why I was doing that. And then I discovered it's because in certain situations, I wanted to soften the delivery. And I thought that was the appropriate way so that I wouldn't hurt any feelings. And what do you think about that? How do you avoid hurting someone and also communicating clearly at the same time? That feedback comes up a lot when people start talking about soft talk. I don't want to come across as pushy or I don't want to come across as a bitch, or I don't want to come across as a, as a, as a, as a dick. First things first, people are way less concerned with you than you think. Okay. Let's get, let's start, let's start there. Let's get, let's get over ourselves by about a uh, half. Okay. <laughs> and you want to know who you're dealing with. Like I w- I want to know who's super touchy and I can't say things around and I got to walk on eggshells around because I'm going to do my very best to, to distance myself from them personally, professionally. I don't want to hang out with those people in my, in my personal life. They're not fun. And I'm not going to, to collaborate with them about business, about anything professional, because they're going to suck. Okay. I have very strong feelings about the coddling of, of America. And there's two schools of thought folks. And one of them is going to age very poorly, which is prepare the path for the child or prepare the child for the path. Okay. I am in the school of resilience. Okay. Resilient, resilient physically, emotionally, psychologically. Because I've seen what happens when, to use Joe Rogan's words, when we try to nerf the world. Oh, and and also most people like clear communication. Just tell me what you want. Just tell me what you want. What do you want me to do? Okay, so in the sake of trying to not hurt other people's feelings, and oh, by the way, people's people were, were were meant to feel things. They don't worry about hurting someone else's feelings. Worry about you hurting your feelings, because guess what? That's what you're doing the most of. And guess what? You're not trying to protect that person in the first place. You're trying to protect you. Mm-hmm. You're trying to, you're trying to protect you from things. And so when it comes on that note, when it comes to speaking, you, what you're looking for is the crossroad of clear speech and low and slow breathing. Very simply, when you're comfortable with what you're saying, other people are going to be comfortable with what you're saying. And if anyone isn't, then good. You want to know about that ASAP. And when I'm, whether I'm asking a girl out on a date, I'm pitching, giving a sales presentation, giving away anything. If my breath is trapped in my chest, I'm going to sound a certain way. And people are smart. People pick up on this stuff. And so when you give someone directions and you're uncomfortable about it, it's going to land poorly. When you are clear and solid in your speech and you're breathing well, also known as low and slow, also known as parasympathetic nervous system response, you're going to, you're, well, you're good. Like I've already said it, you're going to be comfortable. You're comfortable with what you're saying. Okay. It's not about being right all the time, by no means. It's, it's, about, it's about owning your language. Most people do not own their language. They own their words, their stories, their identity. And gun to head, I mean, we're known as the language people. We might as well be known as the language and the breathing people. And gun to head, it's about the breath. So when I show up, when I come on a podcast, it's my 296 podcast that I've been on about this one thing. Um, I'm the head coach of Enlifted. I certify all of our coaches. I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, what I'm three, soon to be four online courses deep. I'm on my third documentary, been interviewed in three documentaries. It's like, this is what I, this is, I do one thing. 
Okay, I do one thing. And when I show up, it's to help people unlock their breathing. Because I know what happens when that happens. Okay, so say that you don't soften. You don't soften and throw in I thinks, I likes, I want, whatever it is that weakens your communication. You mentioned there's something called context collapse. Mm. And how can we use that to better communicate without compromising our own communication and also supporting the other person? Perfect. Give them a solid sentence with a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, We're solid statement with a heart. Okay. So context collapse, we've all experienced this, is when you're looking at a text or an email and you're like, how, how should I read this? Okay. Does it go this way or does it go this way? Because you only have the words. You do not have negation acknowledged. The tone, the inflection, the pace, the facial expression, the gesticulation. You can't see their hands move. All you got is the words. And so that ambiguity, that, that uh, what's, what do they mean by this? That is context collapse. That's why they created emojis. Because people are like, um, help me out over here. Help me out over here. Voicemails help out a lot. Like the difference between a text and a voicemail, very different. Very different. Um, yeah, so that's what context collapse is. And if there's a, if there's a fun and a serious scale we've been a little over on the serious side of things have more fun yeah have more fun with your words because you can like i said be a more interesting person to talk to be a more interesting storyteller okay because that is what that is Mm -hmm. ask more questions breathe low and slow when you're talking to people watch what happens your timing will improve slow down your rate of speech there's another thing so i get asked you can imagine Uh, i get asked what do we do yeah. A lot. And I give a micro answer. I give a macro answer. The micro is soft talk. We do the soft goals, soft talk challenge. Cool. And then the second thing is slow down your rate of speech by about 20% when you're talking to somebody. Watch what happens. Your communication skills will go through the roof. When someone slows down their rate of speech, the breath loosens up. Okay. You will also uh, drastically improve your timing. You will, all, you will drastically improve the pauses. That's a big part of storytelling, okay? The inflection, the whole thing. And um, you will establish this much better rhythm with people. Yeah. And one of the worst communicators I know asks you a question and you get halfway through the answer and then he asks another question right in the middle. So it's just, just very jarring rhythm and a couple of minutes in you're like i think whether you, whether you're clocking this or not you're like i'm not enjoying this i'm not enjoying this this does not feel good good conversation feels good am i right am i am i making that up no spot on that but gets a couple of interesting questions what does good feeling conversation entail Okay. And then what are the byproducts of good feeling conversation? Yeah. You answer those questions, folks. You, you just got more important information than everything you learned in high school. I think people tend to undervalue communication, like I said earlier, because it's something that we are pretty much born with. Very quickly, we pick it up and then we don't, we're not taught to examine our communication styles, our thoughts. This is all just glossed over and we learn pretty much everything else but this. And it also is something that we do throughout the day, every day for the rest of our lives. So it makes sense to spend a few minutes. The exercises you're describing don't take all day. They don't take months or years. They take a few minutes to start opening your awareness and to start breaking bad habits. Show me someone who's created a $100 million company that couldn't tell a good story. Show me someone who has fantastic relationships that's a boring communicator. You see where this is going, folks? It's a very big deal. And most people, like I said, most people's, their, their storytelling skills are uh, majorly underdeveloped. They're even atrophied. Okay? Yeah. Add in cell phones, 
smartphones and the, the, the situation generally speaking is getting worse. Uh, and guess what? That also, that also implies opportunity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Work on your storytelling, work on, work on becoming more and more entertaining. Um, work on becoming a better listener. Work on becoming more economical with your language. If you ever get to the point, the place where you see speech and your use of language as art, then you are on the cusp of something very, very significant. Cool. I love that. Most people are in the, oh, there's just words, game. And then they wonder why things are the way they are. There's one other thing I want to talk about before we start winding down. And this is one that I heard all around me and I didn't know there's a name for it, but that is binary language. Mm. Always and never. Here's, here's the quote about binary language. Uh, always remember to never use always and never. So, um, and what, what it does brings into the part of the conversation about uh, the reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system is the part of you, it's actual hardware uh, in your brain. And it's responsible for you buy a new car, you start seeing that new car out and about all over the place. You ever had that experience? Oh yeah. What was the model? Just out of, for pure curiosity. No, I've had it with other things such as, Dogs, when you finally got a dog, then I noticed dogs everywhere. Everyone seemed everywhere. to have one. Yep. Yep. For sure. That's that's the reticular activating system. My car got stolen once. I had to borrow my dad's farm truck. I drove it around Richmond. This 1985 Ford F-150. There are actually a lot of 1985 Ford F-150s. And the only people that know that are the people that drive 1985 Ford F-150s. So the reticular activating system, once it comes online, or once it, once something gets deemed important, that can um, that can happen through repeated vi- focusing on something, or or it can happen in an instant. When if we emotionalize ab- about something, and like I said, my car got stolen when I was was emotional, and um, only when I realized, by the way, I didn't care about the car. This is funny. People are funny. I'm funny. I only got emotional when I realized that my kickboxing gear was in the back of that car that I'd had for six years. And it was leather. It was really nice. It was all worn in and just, it was an extension of me. I'd done rounds in Thailand and all over the place. Like I would take it with me when I traveled, which used to be a lot. And I'd just drop into, it was called the Wu-Tang Roadshow. And I, as soon as it dawned on me that it was in the back, I was like, that's when I got mad. Anyway, um, have you ever her you so you're doing something and you catch a noise out of the side of your ear and then you can't stop hearing that noise yeah. like some annoying thing that's the reticular activating system you ever had somebody tell you some surprisingly good news about someone and it changes the picture of them in your head mm-hmm. that's the reticular activating system works both ways too you somebody tells you some surprisingly unfortunate news or bad news about someone and it changes the picture in your head and then you see him at a a, a, a party and you're like Ooh, you just go that way instead of that, right? That's the reticular activating system. So always and never. She never lets me finish my sentences. It's a projection with a sprinkle of binary language in there. She never lets me finish my sentences. Okay? So my reticular activating, so when, if someone says that, especially if they're like, turn up the volume on the feels about it, which is, will be quite common. Uh, the reticular activating system. So like I said, it goes on a search and edit mission. So when I'm looking for more and more of the, while, so while you were seeing more of those dogs, you're, you're, you're picking up less and less, I mean, fill it in other pets. When I'm finding more and more of those 1985-ish Ford F-150s, I'm editing out white Oldsmobiles and red Beetles because it's not the thing I'm looking for. So when I say she never lets me finish my sentences, I the reticular activating system goes cool. It's impartial. It goes on a search mission to find those examples. So I remember the, the four times that these 
different social interactions over the past five years where she just butt in and, 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 and she embarrassed me. There's some more. And then it also edits out any other time where she has. Look at the words. Let me finish my sentences. Okay. Take out the never, take out the always and put in sometimes. And you're going to have a more accurate interpretation of the event. Okay. She sometimes cuts me off. Okay. She, as opposed to she always cuts me off in conversation. Always? Well, not always. Okay, cool. Sometimes what well, seems like it happens a lot. Fine. You can have some often. You want often? Well, it's not really often, but it just it really pisses me off when she does. Fine. Sometimes. See how this thing goes back and forth until you get a more act because we're not it, right and wrong, good and bad. That's an, that's somebody else. That, that's shit's over my head. Give me accuracy. Okay. Yeah. Give me accuracy in the storytelling process. Everything will be better for me and my breathing from there. <sighs> See how the breath unlocks. She, yes. She sometimes interrupts me in conversations. Okay. And then what I just did is I took this big, huge picture with mushroom clouds all over it. And I just shrunk it down. And now it's this thing over here. It's more manageable. Okay. And then from there. Okay. Or I, I never finish anything that I start. Never, nothing ever. Well, I mean, I sometimes finish things. Okay, great. Give me three examples. What do you mean? Give me three examples of three times you finished something that was important to you. And I bet you money, if you hand hand them a pen and a piece of paper uh, and give them five minutes, they're going to get three. All right. And then, then you start building another case for yourself. Because most people are, secretly building a case against themselves with their words. And then they, they, and then, and then, you know, not fun things happen from there. So use your words, folks, cut your soft talk in half. You'll double your confidence, slow down your rate of speech from time to time. When you're talking to people, watch what happens. You'll like it. So will they build a, build a, write down three things that you've, the three things that you're most proud of. And I'm not talking about half a sentence about the thing. I'm talking title the event and give me three paragraphs about it, two paragraphs about it. Give me the facts and the details. Okay. Force your reticular activating. This is actually harder than it, than it sounds. Force yourself to, to write down some things you've done well that will also help you get in, in touch with how glued your reticular activating system is for better or for worse to you not being good enough, which is what this thing boils down. We're here to break the spell of a telephobia, the fear of not being good. Enough. That's what that is. It's got, it's got a name. 95% of everything boils down to a telephobia, the fear of not being good enough. Mm. Spooky. Wow. So Mark, if all knowledge on earth is gone, you get to save the works of three teachers. Who would you choose and why? Nikola Tesla, free energy sounds cool. Joel Salatin. Because somebody's going to have to regrow everything. He's a he's a farmer, right up the road. And then um, Buckminster Fuller, mm. Bucky Balls. <laughs> get, get some Bucky Balls and geodesic domes going. Yeah, that's first three that come to mind. Okay, it's a damn good question, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we didn't even talk about in lifted coaching. We certify coaches. Uh, level one is all about the dismantling of the victim mentality. How to do that. And it's equal parts personal and professional development. So we take a major bite out of crime of your own personal story, the victim mentality, the, the imposter syndrome, and then give you the tools the same tools you use, the, you get the same tools applied to you and your story with some extra bells and whistles because we're coaches got to be ahead of the game that you're going to turn around and facilitate that same transformation with, uh, with your clients, which absolutely translates to um, uh, increased confidence in your ability to deliver value and make money coaching. And lifted.me mm. that, um, yeah, and lifted.me go there. You can get, uh, recording of the we do a, a 90 minute and lifted essentials open to the public free workshop quarterly i might already said quarterly and um if you like what the website says 
you've enjoyed this podcast, go and if you sign up on the, the, the website, you'll get a recording of that. That's the very next step. And if you have any other questions, you can book in for a discovery call and talk to, talk to, talk to Kimberly about it. Yeah. Language is and leads to mindset and mindset is the prerequisite to any kind of lasting beneficial change. So I think that's a very powerful thing for people to work on. Okay. A couple rapid fire questions before we close this one out. For those interested in learning more about becoming a better storyteller, myself included, do you have any resource recommendations? Pick up a book every day for a week. Okay. For three minutes a day. So once a day, seven days in a row, and read at 70 to 75 to 80% of your normal rate of speech for three minutes. Mm. That's going to get your head around it. Mm. Okay. Because that's where the whole thing starts. I am, like I said, I'm the head coach of Inlipsid. I deliver all the trainings. And as a byproduct of, I stopped counting in 2017 at uh, 500 professional presentations, okay, in person. And after we did our 2017 TEDx talk, smashed it on stage in front of 1,800 people, live streamed 155,000 people, no pressure, okay? You can see it on YouTube, Mark England TEDx talk, crushed that thing. Uh, people started asking for help with their presentation skills. And so this is the only, this is the only one-on-one coaching that I do on the side. And so it's just word of mouth. Within the first five minutes, we're talking about rate of speech. It's that yes. important because most people, because of a lack of preparation, if this is something that interests you, I can come on and do another podcast about the differences between professionals and amateurs when it comes to presentation skills. It'll be the very best wow. talk about presentation skills any of your audience has ever heard. And I love it. It's my favorite thing to talk about under the umbrella of coaching which awesome. is presentation skills. Yeah. Cause I know what happens when people improve that most people jam themselves in an upregulated state, a stress state due to a lack of preparation. Cause most people play the amateur game when it comes to speaking and then, and then you talk too fast, you lose range, you lose timing. It's just bad things happen from there. So slow down your rate of speech, read a book slow every day for a week for three minutes. And then, that's that's my answer. That's a great tip because my issue is that I speak too fast and it's not a coincidence that I also listen to podcasts at 3x and watch YouTube videos at about the same speed. So naturally, since I'm surrounded by that speed, the rate of speech tends to be higher than it should also. Okay, Mark, what's been the best life-changing purchase you've made under $500? It's had a disproportionate effect. Well, that's easy. John Wolf's Morning Mobility, $9.99, $9.99 on it library. 10 20 minute mobility workouts for 10 bucks. I'm gonna say that again. 10 20 minute mobility durability. They call it durability. Durability. This is the stuff that'll see you through. Okay, because when I, I know about career ending injuries. And most of the time it's joint stuff. You take care of your joints, which is the thing that most people, cause it's not the high end sexy stuff. It's the stuff that most people, um, overlook 10, 20 minute. You can do a 20 minute mobility class. You'll feel like great afterwards. 10, 20 minute mobility on it. Library, John Wolf morning mobility. No hands down. It's $10. Easy, clear and concise. Okay, Mark, what's one thing that your tribe does not know about you? Mentioned that I'm afraid of sharks on a couple of podcasts. I don't like them, man. And it only, it only, it only kicked into place in, in my early, a lot of the coaches don't know that unless they've listened to some obscure podcasts. It clicked into place when I, in my early 30s. I used, yeah, I know. I used to swim out with my dog and like, way past the break and, and not now, dude, it's like, it's take out the jaws. The, those seeds came to fruition. And, Cause I remember watching that shit when I was a kid behind my dad's, uh, uh, recliner down at the beach. And then 
you know, sometimes you plant a tree and it grows later. Uh, I won't go out past the break. And I am so cool with that. Like, I don't want get over your fear. No, <laughs> there's sharks out there. Yeah, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. Um, I like it. Yeah. Any final thoughts that you want to leave listeners with? Do the soft talk challenge. Read a book slow. Three minutes a day for seven days. Give it that a shot, folks. Give it a shot. Watch what happens. Because the quality of your life is directly correlated to the quality of your story telling ability and you can get you can get a lot better quick okay look pay attention to the most entertaining people that you know personally in your life um and and the people that you respect you know in in whatever field of interest that you have and i'll guarantee you they're not boring chances that they're boring are very slim very slim so become a better storyteller and go live your life well those recommendations are very simple practical anyone can do them and if they want to go a little further with this they can hire an enlisted coach or if vocabulary is still around they can take that but Mark, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today on the Mind Body Peak Performance Podcast. Nick, thank you for having me. Everybody, thanks for listening. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, yeah, man, it's a, it's a very good show. I had fun. We'll do a follow up at some point on how to master the art of storytelling. But today, that's all. Thank you guys for tuning in. And remember to be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary